Oh, well, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Encore and welcome to a little bit cooler morning. I'll take it, I'll take it. But it is good to be here and get a chance to celebrate with you, celebrate what Jesus has done for us, celebrate our relationships with each other, and just have a really good time. Um, no memory verse this week, so we're going to move right to our table. Th- well, no memory verse from last week. We'll have one at the end of today. So we're going to move right to our table talk question. This is really interesting. This week, uh, I leave on Thursday. We get back on Saturday. We're having our pastor elders retreat. We have one once a year. And we usually, the last couple of years, we've headed up to Leavenworth. So that's where we're going. And it's just a great time of building relationships with each other and, and working on our vision and what's next for Canyon Hills. So be, be praying for, for us, for the pastors and for the elders this, this uh, weekend. And this year... We're actually bringing our wives with us, which is so much fun. But uh, yeah, so we even pray for us harder. But, um, but I love hanging in Leavenworth. How many of you like to go to Leavenworth? Leaven- Leavenworth's a blast. And this year we get to choose an activity that we want to do. Each of us as individuals, the pastors and elders. So we get to choose between going hiking, water rafting, zip lining, hor- horseback riding, or just going shopping in Leavenworth. We, we get to choose. So what do you think I chose? What would I choose? I chose zip lining. I wanted to go zip lining, but, but my wife does not do heights. This would scare her. So, so we're going shopping. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'll head to the hat shop and try to find something fun. But anyhow, uh, it, it really is. It's, it's a blast. And I, and I do love walking, walking the street of Leavenworth and doing some shopping. So here's our table talk question. Since weather's gotten a little bit nicer outside, if you could choose, if you could hang out anywhere in Washington for a couple of days, has to be in Washington. If you could hang out anywhere in Washington for a couple of days, where would you want to hang out? And what would you want to do? Okay? Anywhere in Washington, where would you want to hang out? What would you want to do? I'll let you talk around the tables for a couple minutes. And then I'll get a couple of answers. All right. All right. Good. I almost said good morning. What? I already said that. Forget that. So, silence your talk, not your phones. Well, do that too. So, question. Where would you want to hang out in Washington? What would you want to do? This is the hardest part because I can't hear everybody really well, but yes. Where and what? Lake Kavanaugh. Lake Kavanaugh? Yeah. And do what? Just hang out at the lake. Swim, boating. Oh, swim, boating, skiing. I'm too old, but I like Yeah. <laughs> You're not too old to ski. Come on. You can pull it off. You're ready to go to heaven. So am I, so... We can pull it off. Anybody else? Where and what? A couple more. Yeah. Over in the Blue Mountains, uh, five miles from Oregon, and it's east of Walla Walla. They have a cabin. Go, go hang out at your cabin in the Blue Mountains. And listen to the quiet. And listen to the quiet. Oh, that sounds good sometimes, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah. Go to the hot air balloon festival in Walla Walla. Go to the hot air. He wants to go to the hot air balloon festival in Walla Walla. Who, who's been up in a hot air balloon? Not, not me. I don't know. Yeah. Downtown Seattle at night. Downtown Seattle at night. Okay, we're going to close with that one. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, yeah. With Uni Gospel Mission, just trying to help people out. Yes. Okay, I... I've been down there at night with Uni Gospel Mission. Yeah, and I do believe in prayer. All right. So, but anyhow, no, that, they, I shouldn't joke about that. They do an incredible work in downtown Seattle. I need to, yeah, I shouldn't joke about that. Okay, Carolyn, I'm going to turn stuff over to you. I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, listening to our prayer requests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a good morning, folks. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. (laughs) 
And hello to everyone out there in YouTube land. Hi, everybody. Come on in and join us when you can. Uh, before we go any further, I'd like to ask you all to make sure that your phones have been silenced or shut off, please, so that we do not get interrupted. Thank you very much. So, did you notice that we went from winter right into summer, right smack dab in the middle of it? Did you notice that? And now we're going back to spring. Oh, well, weather changes just like we do. So hang on, we'll get summer back tomorrow or the next day. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of first-time visitors we'd like to, visit, uh, to welcome today. Whoops. Hang on. All oh, my cards are falling down. Our first one is Sue Bray. Sue, where are you sitting so we may welcome you? Hello, Sue. Nice to see you. Welcome. Also, would like to welcome, wait a minute, Rolf Dalkey? Is that how you say your name, Rolf? There you are. Let's welcome Rolf. Nice to have you guys here. And we'd love to welcome back one of our longtime favorites who's here for the summer, Connie Morgan. <laughs> welcome back, Connie. So nice to have you back. Okay. So how about those Krakens? So close. Hey, but let's give them a round of applause right now. I think, I think they made history. They're the first team ever that, in, that defeated the Stanley World Cup in their first round of playoffs. And then they went to the seventh game in the second round and just missed it. So they, they should not hang their heads. They are, let, wait and see what they do next year, right, guys? Yeah. And wait, but wait, there's more. How about Cal Raleigh? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Cal Raleigh is a mariner. And last night he made history in Boston at Fenway Park. He is a switch hitter, which means he can hit either left-handed or right-handed. So I think it's when there's a left-handed pitcher, he hits right-handed. And when there's a right-handed pitcher, he hits left-handed, something like that. Well, he hit two two-run home runs in the two uh, fifth and sixth, sixth inning, I think. He made history. It's never been done before anywhere by a catcher. And he's a catcher, so... Hooray for Cal Raleigh. Woo! -hoo! I won't give you any more detail, but you know, they won last night 10 to 1, just in case you guys know. So, all that to say, um, let's move on to a, I have a commercial to make. And this is the last notice you will get from me about the upcoming Mosaic concert that's going to be held at Woodenville Alliance Church this coming Saturday uh, at uh, 6 o'clock. It's Saturday, May 20th. It, there's no ticket required. Uh, come early because it fills up quickly. So it's a Mosaic Choir and Orchestra concert this coming Saturday, Woodenville Alliance Church. I have little brochures for you, if for anyone who wants them on my table afterwards, okay? And lastly... National, the national day for today? Ride a unicycle day. <laughs> okay. How many of anybody ever ridden a unicycle? Really? Oh my gosh, I'd be so scared. And also, it's national barbecue day. Woohoo! <laughs> So my last thing I'd like to say before I get into the re uh, prayer request is um, we're going to be celebrating Memorial Day next week. Memorial Day this year is on the 29th, Monday of May, and um, our, that week it will be too late to have it when we, when we come in on the 30th. So we're going to celebrate next week on the 23rd and remember those who have died for our country, for our freedom on that day. So let's get into the praises. Our praises are this week are the rowdy table has a prayer a, a request no a, a praise report <laughs> blessings from Carnot Reef God bless me with the 
fun finding of her lost Bible that she had lost. Well, thank you, Lord. Woohoo! Rosie McDowell has a praise, praise for the good report. She still needs prayer for getting better. So let's keep Rosie in our prayers and give the Lord praise for making her better. Hello. Yeah. A praise from Maya Jane Larson. The Greens' first great-grandbaby arrived two weeks late, but came in at 22 and a half inches long and 8.7 pounds. Happy and healthy. Let's praise the Lord for that. woo Prayer requests. This is a prayer request from Bob Heddeen. Please pray for his in-person job interview in Edmonds tomorrow at 1 o'clock. We'll be praying for you, Bob, as you go in for that long-awaited interview. This is a prayer request from Bob and Diane uh, Bernhoff. Prayers for Dave S. He is in Providence Hospital with major cancer setbacks. So let's pray for Dave. Prayer request from Algene, a prayer request for Algene Ristau. She's in the hospital at Evergreen. Pray for wisdom for the doctors to treat and care correctly for him. Excuse me, that's a guy, not a lady. So let's pray for Algene. Uh, pray for a son's friend. This is from Brandy. Robert Nelson has has had that tissue-eating disease and has to have his leg amputated. So let's pray for Robert. Jim and Kirsten Shaw, we leave for Hawaii this Thursday for two weeks. Oh, so sad. With our daughter, Carolyn, her husband, Andrew, and their five kids, please pray for health. Are you serious? <laughs> That's what you call going in from the pan into the fire, right? Or something like that. So anyway, they're asking for prayer, for health, safety, and patience for all nine of them. <laughs> That's awesome. So that's all that I have for today. I'm going to ask Darren Sprague to come on up and pray for us. Uh, God bless you guys. We love you very much. Right? Don't we, Pastor? Oh, yeah. Thank you. God bless you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your loving kindness upon us. We come to you knowing full well that you have heard these prayer requests that are being lifted up to you. And we trust, Lord Jesus, that you will work out the details to bring yourself glory. We pray for healing. We pray for comfort. We pray for your name to be glorified in all the lives of each one of us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Gosh, that last prayer request. I have five kids. And I try and avoid going on vacation with them at any cost. Uh, I love my wife, but at this point, my kids can't tell the difference between Hawaii and the beach on Edmonds. So we'll just go to the beach at Edmonds, save ourselves a lot of time and a lot of money. It's a good space to be. Uh, hey, today is a special day. Well, first off, um, this lady standing next to me is not my daughter, Dallas, as a few people have already said, oh, it's so good to see your daughter again. They look very similar, but um, this is Bella. She's our newest staff worship leader here at the church. And so this is day two of her second week. So I sent her a text last night and I was like, hey, you should come lead an encore with me. You're going to love them and they will love you. And she graciously said yes. So here we are. Um, and Pastor Jeff's going to uh, interview her a little bit later, but you're gonna see a lot more of her in this next season, and I just trust that that'll be a good thing. So uh, why don't we all get to our feet and let's prepare to spend some time worshiping the Lord. This morning, sitting at my kitchen table, this is the passage of scripture that just blessed me. Psalm 66, 16 says, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. And I was just reminded 
as I was sitting there and there's again, see five kids, it's a couple, we got like an hour of quiet in the morning before pandemonium breaks out. Um, I was just reminded of what a sweet gift it is to have a testimony. Uh, what a sweet gift it is to be reminded of what the Lord Jesus has done for our souls. And I don't know about you, but I just kind of get distracted by the everyday things of life that I can lose sight of the significant blessings. And I think the testimony is meant to infuse graciousness into our hearts. It's meant to infuse just a gratitude before the Lord for all that he's done when we remember that we were once lost, but now we've been found. We were once blind, but now we see. We were once enemies of God, but now we are called friends. But I also think the power of testimony is we get to proclaim what the Lord has done in us to the people around us. We get to remind them of the good things that the Lord has done, that for those that are downcast, for those that are burdened, for those that are hurting, they might be reminded of the joy that is already theirs or the joy that they can be theirs if they would turn to Jesus. So today as we sing, I just hope and pray that you would be reminded of your testimony, that you'd be reminded of the reason for joy that you have because of what Jesus has done for your soul. Do so you sing this with me? Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of
never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God cause all my goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after
cross to die But not even death itself Could hold you down For you rose to life Searching on Thank you for this time to just sing praise to you, Lord. What a gift that is. Lord, um, today I was reminded of just what a joy it is to have a testimony and what that means. And I was reminded of my own testimony and just the ways in which you have worked in my life and the ways that you led me to the cross, um, led me to my salvation. And that was such a source of encouragement and gratitude for me, Lord. And so I just ask, um, for that encouragement and gratitude for everyone in this room to be reminded of the goodness that you have done in their hearts and their lives and um, that just bring them to so much encouragement, um, Lord. Our testimonies are such a source of encouragement, Lord, and um, I just pray that that encouragement leads us to um, want to talk about you more and want to want to share your goodness and share your faithfulness and share those stories of, of you working in our lives um, for the rest of our lives, Lord. Um, you. you are so good. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Go, you guys can go ahead and be seated, but not you, Bella. You hang out here with me for just a couple minutes. Now, get that scary look off your face. These people are pretty nice. There's only a couple of them. I won't, tell, I won't show you which ones. But, um, so... I want to share a couple things about our, our worship team. I, I love having you guys come in and, and lead us. And David, who leads us sometimes too, plays piano, keyboards, he recently got married. And so we thought, well, we'll show you a picture, a couple pictures of his wedding. Here's David and Katie. And they just got married. Isn't that so cool? David and Katie. But anyhow, Bella, let's say back to you. All right. So Bella, where did you grow up? How did you come to Christ? Um, I grew up, I was born in Kirkland, and then my family moved to Houston, Texas for like 10 years, and we moved back here about 10 years ago, so like half and half. I'm 20, so I really did a good half and half, Texas and in Washington, but I live in Snohomish now. <laughs> well, Snohomish, where? Um, near like Maltby Cafe area. Ooh. Big fan of Maltby Cafe. All yeah. Right. I worked there for a little bit too. <laughs> you did? I did, yeah. <laughs> How heavy are those cinnamon rolls? They're like really, they're like three or four pounds. <laughs> they're they're if you've really never been, heavy. If you've never been there and had one of the cinnamon rolls, they're about the size of your face. It, yeah, it, it's cute. like a one meal deal for the day. It's all, it's all you need. So, wait, now where'd you go to high school? I went to North Creek High School, which is just up the road from here. Okay, all right. Because I always tell people, if you grew up around here, we can be friends unless you went to Juanita. <laughs> no, I didn't because, go to Juanita. No, okay, all right, good. I went Where to Lake, you go? Did you Lake go to Washington High School. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah no. so, right, so, all right, so, um, so do you grow up in a church? Yes, I grew up going to church with my family, grew up Catholic with my family, and um, yeah, I always loved going to church, didn't really think about it too deeply, didn't really quite understand everything, and um, it wasn't until high school years, I was about 15 when I started attending here um, with some friends that I really started to fully understand the fullness of the gospel. And really, it was just the past few years that I, I truly feel like I came into the full understanding of, of the freedom we have in Christ. And it's been, it's been a slow, gradual, the Lord just like working on my heart over these past many years. So, so who's your high school pastor here? Um, John Walker. Might have had a couple. John Walker. Yeah. Oh, we love John. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so cool. So... 
you've just started working here. Yes. Right? And you grew up here. You went, did you, in high school, go to our worship academy? Yes. <laughs> Which is the coolest thing. I don't know if you know that we've set up, we take high schoolers, middle schoolers who, who think they're interested in maybe leading worship and actually train them to do that. that. And now you're yeah. standing right up here. All right. I, and I was, I was an intern here my senior year of high school with a group of a few of us. And yeah, Chelsea Mason was in charge of that for the uh, most part. There and, you go. Yeah, it was, it was a good Chelsea. time. <laughs> so what's the favorite part of your job? Oh, well, I love it. All of it. Um, I, my main thing while well, in, this, in this season right now and probably for a while is college ministry. So I get to lead worship in that space oh. over there with the college students. Um, and that so far, just getting to know the team that I get to work with and getting to know the students a little bit. I've only been there literally once, but well, three times. <laughs> but um, that's, that's been a great joy and it's right. really exciting to lead worship for them and get to know them and talk about Jesus with them. All right. Well, Bella, it is so good to get to know you just a little bit. But we can't leave without asking you. Favorite ice cream? Yes. Easy. Chocolate, mint chocolate chip. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> we, can, we can be friends. All right. Thank you, Bella. And thank you for leading us this morning. That's so good. All right. For the rest of you guys, grab your Bibles. Open up to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. We are turning a big corner as we walk through the Gospel of John today, as we go through, uh, as we start, we're not going to finish this chapter today, but as we start John 13 today, we're turning a, a big corner in, the, in this book. But let me start by asking you a question. What, oh, and this is an interesting question, but what if you knew that in about 24 hours, you'd be dead? Nice thought, right? Bella, come up here. Let's lead another song or something. But welcome to church. But let's say you did. How would you want to spend that last week? Where would you want to go? Who would you want to spend it with? Maybe you'd want to go to Arizona. I know, Connie, you just got back from Arizona because it's getting too hot there right now, right? Or maybe you'd want to head to the Bahamas or who knows, maybe out into the woods somewhere. I think I would lean Hawaii with, uh, with Jim, yeah, and Kirsten. Yeah, who does? Oh, just go hang out. Oh, yeah, but not with like 37 grandkids or whatever you're, you're going there with, but, but Hawaii. But I probably wouldn't choose Monroe or Duval, just saying. Uh, and then who would you want to spend that time with? I mean, would you want to spend it with family or friends? Or maybe would you want to spend it with somebody who you know does not yet know the Lord and, and you want to have one more, one more chance to share the gospel with him? But who would you want to spend that time with? Maybe you'd want to just go on a donut date with your grandkids. Here's me with five of my seven grandkids uh, just a couple weeks ago. I, I, I love that. Yes, when they hang out with me, I get them all sugared up and then send them home. That's what granddads do as payback to their parents for how their parents acted as kids. I'm just, just saying. But yeah, uh, but I think we'd all agree that if we knew that that was coming, it would be a tough time. And it would be a time that I'd want to plan out, a time that everything I did, everything I said would be important and probably more intentional than the way I normally live. And that's exactly where we find Jesus as we open up John 13. He knew that his death on the cross was this close. He had about a day left before he's going to be laid in the tomb. Now, this chapter begins what most Bible teachers call the upper room discourse, because this discussion we're about to jump into happens in the upper room. And it continues through chapters 16 and 17. And then they go, and they go from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is arrested and handed over to be tried. Now, at this point, in, in John's record of Jesus' life, <clears throat> he begins to slow way down. John does. He doesn't just pump the brakes. He, he, he goes like school zone slow right now. I mean, chapters 1 through 12 cover about three and a half years of Jesus' life. Well, they start with pre-life, but uh, three, three and a half years of his ministry. Then chapters 13 and 18 cover mostly, 13 through 18 cover mostly one night. John devotes about a third of his gospel to Jesus' last two days. So I want you to come with me to the upper room. The last night that Jesus spends with his disciples before he's killed. 
and experience a little bit of what happened there. So if you got your Bibles open to John 13, let me just start us out by reading the first few verses here, and then I'll pray. So John 13, I'll start reading verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things, given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper, got it from the table, laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. That's where we're headed this morning. Let's pray. Father, um, I just thank you for the chance we have to open your word this morning and to learn from you. <clears throat> Please, as we open your word, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds. Allow us to hear clearly from your spirit this morning. Let us get a, just a deep look into the life of your son and learn from how he walked. And it's in his name that we pray, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So remember, we've got four historical records of the life of Jesus recorded for us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're the first four books of the New Testament. We've been walking our way through John for, I don't know, a couple weeks. But now, when it, actually for quite a while. And now we come to an event, the event that we're looking at this morning. Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus on a lot more of the details than we get from John. Uh, so we may take a detour or two as we look at this story into one, of those, uh, into one of those gospel accounts for a little bit of extra information. But first, before we dive into it, let's quickly look at the context. By looking at the week leading up to this time in the upper room. So if you remember, <clears throat> Saturday night, <clears throat> Jesus was at a private dinner with some close friends in Bethany. And it was a thank you party thrown in his honor for raising uh, his buddy Lazarus from the dead. That was kind of a big deal. So that's Saturday night. Then Sunday, Sunday, which we looked at three weeks ago, I think it was, that we looked at the palm, what I call the Palm Branch Parade, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem at the start of Passover week. And that was a huge deal. I mean, Jesus at that point, he had rock star status. The tree, streets are lined with, with people. His disciples are hanging out with him as his roadies, you know, carrying all of his equipment and all that stuff. He's the talk of the town. And many thought that he was the Messiah. And this week, Passover week, he would take over and establish his kingdom on earth. Okay, that Sunday, Jesus we're told Jesus hung out in town just for a little while and then went back out of town to stay with his friends in Bethany again. Remember, there wasn't a whole lot of room to stay in Jerusalem at that time. I and mean, we were told that at times there was up to two and a half million people that came to celebrate Passover. That's a crowded place. I mean, the no vacancy signs were up on every hotel and every bed and breakfast in the place. But Passover was kind of like, you know, Seafair, the Super Bowl, Easter and Christmas all wrapped into one. Well, maybe not... Christmas and Easter to the Jews, but you, but you get the idea. There was no bigger party in Jerusalem, no bigger week all year than Passover week. So every day of this week, Jesus and his disciples made the two, two mile track, trek uh, from Bethany, uh, you know, over the Mount of Olives and down through the thick groves of trees and headed into Jerusalem. So the triumphal entry, entry was Sunday. Then the next day, Monday, we're told he goes back into town and he, cl he cleansed the temple for a second time. And then he healed some people who had followed him, you know, who were lame and blind, you know, just a normal day in the life of Jesus. He's tipping over tables in the temple and then healing people, you know, that's what it was like hanging out with Jesus. Well, Tuesday, so that's Monday, there will be a test at the end. You should be taking notes. So Tuesday, Tuesday was a day of conflict. You know, we're told he had several, several encounters with the religious leaders who were trying to get him to trip up by asking him questions so that they could get evidence to arrest him and have him tried, which didn't work out, by the way. So that's Tuesday. Wednesday of that week was probably a day of rest. We don't have a whole lot of 
information about that day recorded for us in the Gospels. But Thursday, Thursday finds Jesus and the disciples back in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover together. And that's where we're headed today. A lot happened between the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that, on, on that Sunday and then this Thursday morning. Remember, he cleansed the temple. He did a lot of teaching. He withered a fig tree, which was really cool, except for the tree's owner. He, I was reading that in my vine time the other day, and I'm going, that's kind of a cool, well, wait a second, unless I own the tree. But he baffled the Pharisees and put them in their place a couple times. And I can imagine that all those events of that, of that week must have been swirling around in the minds of Peter and John as they went to work getting all the final preparations ready for their Passover meal together. Jesus had asked those two to head into town and get everything ready for the celebration. So they're running around making sure everything is ready just right for the disciples to celebrate Passover. You know, room secured, check. You know, wine ready, check. Lamb ready for the barbie, check. Hey, uh, John, we got a pretty good price for Passover week. Yeah, not too bad, but Jaime's always been really good to us. So, <clears throat> glasses and plates ready, check. Couch arranged just right with all the, all the pillows for the great pictures they're going to paint for us later, paint of us later, check, all ready. Let's go tell Jesus we're good to go. Hey, hey Pete, I can picture John. Hey, Pete, you think tonight's tonight? Well, what, what do you mean? Do you think tonight's the night that Jesus lays out his plans for us about his taking over? Ah, I don't know, but I've got the feeling that something's up. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K, Ted. Uh, but at this point, at this point, the disciples were pretty convinced he was the Messiah and that the kingdom he was setting up was going to be an earthly one. Uh, so they're ready for Jesus to bust out the tanks and the Uzis and just take over. So evening comes, and they head to the house to celebrate the Passover, and tradition tells us it was probably at the disciple Mark's house. Don't know for sure. But anyhow, this was going to be a private party. No outsiders, you know, no press corps, no cameras. This was Jesus and the 12 one more time. So they go inside. Everything is set up, and it's just like perfect. Candlelight fills the room. You know, you can smell the fresh, the fresh baked bread and the roasted lamb and onions. I mean, this was going to be good. A meal set for a king. Yeah, that sounds about right, King Jesus. Well, what was Jesus thinking as they headed up there? What did he know? Now, the records that we have tell us that it's pretty clear that he knew pretty much everything. I mean, he knows he's about to die a very painful earthly death. And I imagine he's thinking something like, so what do I need to do to make sure that these men, my guys, are ready for what's about to come? Because it's going to be tough. What if you knew that you were about to be murdered in a painful public way? And what if you knew that a friend of yours was going to betray you, hand you over to your enemies, and he's sitting in the room with you what if you knew the exact day and the time that you'd die? And what if you were only hours away from all this coming to pass? Who would you want to be with? What would you want to do? I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, I think I want Chuck Norris with me. Because he can take on anyone. Like he said in Missing in Action, I don't step on toes, I step on necks. Yeah, I want Chuck with me. But, uh, but really... Jesus had to have all these emotions just swirling around and welling up in him. Like I said, with that extra burden of knowing that there, seated at the table with him, was the man that was going to betray him and set him up to be killed. Well, he thought he was setting him up to be killed. God and Jesus set him up to be sacrificed, set Jesus up to be sacrificed. And he also knew that the trauma of those next few days would shake the disciples' faith to its very core. So he's got to be thinking, what can I do? How can I help them understand and prepare them for what's coming? Okay, so I want you to turn in your Bibles a few pages back to the Gospel, a few pages back to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So just one book back and uh, find chapter 22. And then I'm going to start reading in verse 14 as the uh, supper begins. So Luke chapter 22, verse 14. 
Here's what Luke records for us. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The whole Passover meal is about to be fulfilled, he's saying. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after you've eaten, saying this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. And I can almost hear one of the disciples leaning over to another disciple going, what does that mean? You know, the, the other disciple going, I don't know. He's always saying stuff like that. So what were the disciples thinking as they sat at the table? I mean, their, their minds were running in a totally different direction than Jesus. And we read that in the next verse, well, in verse 24. Here's what we read. And the dispute arose among them. Remember, they're sitting at the table. Jesus just has told them, told them this. And the dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Okay, so Jesus is pouring out his heart to them, sharing with them he's about to die. And they're thinking about Jesus setting up his kingdom and which of them is going to be ranked where as that new kingdom begins. You know, when Jesus sets up his kingdom here in a few days, which of us is going to get the greatest cabinet posts? You know, and Simon the Zealot's thinking, well, <clears throat> I'm going to be the secretary of defense. I mean, I'm a zealot. I know how to use a sword. Matthew, in a hushed tone, is probably going, well, I was a tax collector. And I think secretary of treasury probably suits me, you know, just perfect. And then John whispers, well, you know, I'm going to be vice president because Jesus loves me the most. You know, and Peter goes, what does not toss the pillow? Does two, does not. They're fighting over who's going to be considered the greatest. And then Jesus breaks into their conversation. Look at, look at verse 25, Luke chapter, two, Luke chapter 22 again. Look at verse 25. So he, bu he busts in and he, and he said to them, Okay, okay, guys. The kings of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. And they're probably going, servants are the greatest? Leaders are servants? Right, like that makes sense. We'll look down at verse 28. You are, you are those who have stayed with me in, through all my trials. And I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then they're going, okay, all right. That, that, sounds a little more, that sounds a little more like the way we're thinking. That whole throne thing, I like that. I mean, that, well, I'm all over that. Now, I don't want to get too hard on the disciples here at this point, because if I am, you know, it kind of points the finger at me too. But that's generally the world's attitude, isn't it? The greatest isn't the servant, but the one with the servants. I mean, surely Bill Gates is, is greater than my friend Aramas, who I met when I was in, um, in Peru. He serves the Quechuan Indians up in the foothills of the Andes. And most of what he owns is in this tiny little house that he shares with all of his extended, his extended family. Surely Bill Gates is much better than him or much greater than, you know, that single mom who's struggling to keep her apartment clean and, and put food on her table and trying to be mom and dad to her kids while she tries to teach them about Jesus. Surely Bill Gates is way better than her. But really, who is greater? I guess it depends on which economy you're serving, the Dow Jones or God's NASDAQ? You know, I'd be in him. Well, during their bickering, I, I don't know if Jesus wanted to laugh or cry or just roll his eyes and go, seriously, right? But they couldn't have missed the point more if they tried. 
And right at that moment, Jesus looks at them. He stands up from the table. You know, and the disciples are going, where's he going? What's he need? He takes off his coat, his outer garment. Yeah, I guess it is getting a little hot in here. And he walks over toward this pitcher of water in a basin, and he pours water into the basin. He picks up the towel that they, they, they all see sitting there at the table, as, as, or sitting on the chair, maybe, as, the, as they walked in. And as he, do, as he does that, time froze for the disciples. See, they'd all seen the stuff laying there. They'd seen the towel there. But no one dared do the unthinkable and actually wash on one of the other disciples' feet. None of them did that. I mean, that was a job for the servants, and not just any servant, for the lowliest of the servants. Generally, they didn't even have the Jewish servants do that. It was reserved for the Gentile servants who would wash people's feet. And they're thinking, that's not for throne ruling people like ourselves. I'm not going to wash feet. Now, the foot washing was done to remove all the junk that gets on your feet, all the soil, all the other stuff, like the camel dung that would collect between your toes, you know, on your, on your sandals, you know, as you walk through the streets of dusty Palestine. It was done to honor the guests. It was not done by the guests. And Peter's thinking, I'm Peter. Man, I walked on water. I, I shouldn't be washing other people's feet. You know, maybe that Thaddeus guy. Yeah, Thaddeus should have done it. I bet when they would write all this stuff down, he's not even going to be talked about all that much. He, he should have done that. But Jesus takes that pitcher in that basin. He takes that towel. He heads over to the first disciple, kneels right in front of him, and begins to wash his feet. And you can imagine the disciple looking up at Jesus and just going, this is really happening? He's washing my feet? Think about this. This was Jesus the co-creator of the universe, everything that existed, and he stoops down and starts washing between the toes of his disciples, including Judas? The one that in a few short hours is going to betray him and hand him over to be killed? But that's always Jesus' way, isn't it? His service for others wasn't based on their perceived merit, or worth to the world. He touched lepers. Who does that? He touched and raised the dead. Yikes. I mean, that makes you ceremonially unclean for quite a while. <laughs> he fed the hungry and the homeless. He spoke forgiveness to prostitutes, to tax collectors. And now, just before he's about to go hang on the cross for you and for me, he washes the feet of the one who's going to set him up to be killed. I'm telling you, Encore, this is love. A love I can't fully understand, but it's a love I'm called to imitate. So he washed the disciples' feet, and then he comes to Peter. Oh, Peter. Okay, so back to, back to uh, John 13. <laughs> I love Peter. There's a whole lot of Peter in me and in all of us at times. So uh, in verse 6, Peter once again opens his mouth and inserts his dirty foot. He should have let Jesus wash it first. Okay, verse 6. <laughs> John 13, verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? So Jesus is literally probably kneeling right before Peter, ready to wash his feet. And Peter goes, you're not, no, no, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, duh. <laughs> but afterwards, you're going to understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then don't just wash my feet, but also my hands and my head. Give me a whole bath. And Jesus said to him, the, the one who was bathed doesn't need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. <laughs> See, Peter's, Peter's blown away 
by the fact that the one he identifies as the Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, is now kneeling at his feet and washing his feet. It's unthinkable. You wash my feet, Jesus? Never. If I need my feet washed, I'll wash them myself. And Jesus had to wonder, Father, you sure we picked the right guys to pull off this thing called the church, right? Now, I, I don't mean to make the disciples out to be sponge heads. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole lot easier for us to see what Jesus was doing on this side of the story. But now, everyone's feet are washed, except whose feet? Jesus' feet. Have you ever thought of that? But after what he did, after what he said, no one dared wash his feet, right? So now he sits back down and he tries to explain to them what he just did. Look at verse 12. We'll throw this one up on the screen. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he resumed his place, sat back down, and he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? And they all looked at each other like, <laughs> you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. Basically there he's saying, don't miss the point, guys. I am who you think I am. I'm the I am. And then he says, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to, wa ought to wash one another's feet. So was he saying, let's get out more basins and, and towels and let's do some more of this foot washing thing till all our feet are clean, zestfully clean? No, that's not what he's saying. L look at what he says next, verse 15. For I've given to you an example that you also should do just as I've done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant's not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He says, I've set an example for you to follow. And you're not greater than me, your master. You're not greater than me, the messenger. You're to do what I've done. Now, there are a lot more ways to wash people's feet than with a basin and a towel. But Jesus is saying, if I've served you in this very menial way, don't you ever think of yourselves as too good to take up the towel for someone else. And later they got to be thinking, he even took it up for Judas? And then he says this in verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Notice the blessing doesn't come from just the knowledge of what to do, but with the doing. Those who, are serve, those who serve are blessed too, not just the ones who serve. And many of you could stand up and give a testimony like that where you go, I thought I was serving this other people, these other people, and I was there to bless them. But after I served, I mean, I felt like I was the one that was really blessed. Lots of us have experienced that. And then if that's true, that verse, then when we choose not to take up the towel, not to forgive, not to serve even the Judases in our life, when we choose not to take up the towel, we choose not to be blessed. That is just so counterintuitive, but so God. No matter what the task is or what the service is like or who we're serving, we should be willing to take up the towel. That's the message. Jesus is looking for his church, for you and I, to be a care force of sorts, to be his care force in the world. We ought to be his care force, and our motto should be see need, meet need. <laughs> Big or small, we should all be taking up a towel. Think about Jesus' life of service. What are a couple things that we learn from how he served? I thought of three things. You could probably think of more and better ones. But the first thing I thought of is that his service that we have recorded for us is never based on the importance or perceived value of the ones that he served. If he worried about that, he would have never touched the leper. Lepers are losers. They're outcasts. If, if, he, if, he, uh, if that was why he served, he would have never hung out with, tax with a tax collector. You know, or with that prostitute 
that he offered forgiveness to. I can't be seen with him or her. I mean, what would my real friends think? And what are the headlines in the paper going to say the next day? He was hanging with a tax collector. And surely, if he cared what others thought, he would have been much more careful about not offending the religious leaders. But no, he served simply out of love. Secondly, I feel like his service was never based on what he could get in return. I mean, what could Jesus possibly get in return from anyone that he really needed? I mean, he's the son of God, co-creator of the universe and everything that exists. If he doesn't have something he wants, he just create it. <laughs> what could he get in return was never the issue. He served out of love, simple, pure, unadulterated love. He served people who didn't deserve love, people who weren't even looking for love. And that's so different than the way many serve today. Many serve for the perks, you know, what they can get back for serving, or they serve to build up credit that, you know, that they can call on later. Many serve to build themselves up, to look good. Many serve for the publicity they're hoping for. And a lot of people serve, you know, out of a sense of obligation. Okay, Jesus said I have to serve. Well, if I have to serve, I might as well serve. Tut, tut, it looks like rain. Um, Eeyore, if anybody, anyhow. So, but not Jesus. I mean, Jesus served out of love. And it's that love that should mark <clears throat> our work in this care force we're a part of called the church. A care force that's always willing to take up the towel. So what might it look like in your life to take up a towel for somebody? You know, maybe it's secretly just leaving a gift for somebody to lift his or her spirits up. Maybe it's guarding someone's reputation when the gossip starts flying. Maybe it's with a smile, you know, that's how you bless somebody. Or maybe it's by stopping long enough to actually listen and care for somebody that you know is hurting. Maybe it's taking back the shopping cart for a mom who's trying to get her three kids into the car. Maybe it's simply throwing some kind words or compliments somebody's way as you walk by. How could you pick up the towel, you know, in your church? Maybe it's by really praying for the leadership in the church. We, as part of that leadership, we desperately need that. Maybe it's volunteering to serve some way, like in the nursery or in our kids' ministry somewhere or on our, our FIT team, our First Impressions team. Maybe it's by finding somebody in the church that's in need and simply blessing them with your time or your resources you know, that God's given you. Maybe it's coming to church or Encore, looking around and looking for that visitor, the loner, the herder, and reaching out to them on purpose. You know, walking into the room with a towel looking for people's feet that need to be cleaned. But if we start intentionally looking for ways to pick up a towel, we're going to see those opportunities all around us. So how can I maybe pick up a towel in my neighborhood? You know, maybe it's mowing a neighbor's lawn while they're on vacation, just making sure their Doberman is locked up in the backyard while you do it. Anyhow. Maybe it's leaving cookies on a doorstep and ringing the doorbell and running away. You know, ding dong, drop and run is what I call it. <laughs> Maybe it's as simple as walking through your neighborhood and praying. You know, you want to make an, an impact on your neighborhood for Christ? Walk like he walked with a towel in his hand, looking for opportunities. What would it look like to pick up a towel in your home? I, I don't even want to go there. That's too convicting. But there's a lot of examples that come to my mind. But if I look for ways to serve my spouse, or you look for ways to serve your spouse or your roommate, or you're going to find them. And don't hesitate. Don't question those towel thoughts that you have that come to your mind. Just do them. Again, the point is, there are so many ways that we can pick up a towel during our everyday life and wash the feet of those around us. I mean, we see dirty feet. We see the towel. So we need to pick up the towel and wash some feet. And again, not because we have to, not because we're looking for something in return, but because we're following the example of Jesus, who said, I've set an example for you to follow, so do it. 
And that brings me to the last thing I see about Jesus' love and service. So number one, his service was not about perceived value of those he served. His service certainly wasn't based on what he could get in return. And thirdly, Jesus' service, <clears throat> he served never counting the cost. Jesus never served counting the cost. He didn't ask, how much is it going to cost me? I mean, and we clearly see that in his next act of service, his last act of service. Because not long after he put down that wet towel, he picked up a wooden cross. And with that cross came nails. And with those nails came pain. And with that pain came death. And with that death came our forgiveness. In my vine time this morning, I'm, I'm going through the Gospel of Mark, and I'm almost done going through that with my wife. And, and this morning, we were looking at Jesus' death on the cross. And I got to tell you, I, every time I read that, that story, I get so emotional. To think of Jesus <clears throat> being beaten, spit on, hung on a cross, they put a fake crown on him, put a purple robe on him. Oh, he's the king. Then they hung him on a cross. And from the cross, he hears them mocking him. And somebody looking up at him and go, yeah, if you're really who you say you are, why don't you jump down off that cross? Oh, if I was me on the cross, I would jump off that cross and that dude would be on the cross. <laughs> I'm so glad Jesus ain't me. I'm just saying but I wonder if Paul had in mind that scene from the upper room that we just looked at, you know, an event that no doubt he heard from the disciples, maybe even heard about it from John's own lips. But I wonder if this scene was in the back of his mind when he wrote those words in Philippians chapter two that we looked at last year. In Philippians two, here's what he says, familiar words, but listen, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, Jeff, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So the big question is, does this take up the towel attitude that's up on the screens right there? Does that describe my life? <clears throat> he took up the towel for you. He took up the towel for me. And now he says we should do the same. Jesus says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And he modeled for us what it looks like to take up the towel. I mean, the needs are everywhere. In our home, our neighborhood, our apartment complex, our workplace, if you're still working. And they're all over in this room too. And we need to take up the towel and start washing some feet. Here's our memory verse for this week, and it focuses on the challenge Jesus gives us. And I, I want to say it together a couple times. Let's do this. We'll do the address before and after. Let's say this together. John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. John 13, 14. Let's say that one more time. John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. John 13, 14. Wow. I picked that verse on purpose so it could be floating in my head all week. <clears throat> now, now it's time for us to, uh, to talk about some of what we looked at this morning. So I'll give you a couple questions, table talk questions, and I'll give them to you one at a time and give you a couple minutes to talk about each one. The first one's more of a fun one, okay? You ready for this? What are one or two things left on your bucket list that you'd like to do? I mean, if you knew the end was coming in a while, what are a couple things left on your bucket list that you'd like to do? Go ahead. I'll let you talk around the table. 
Okay. Here's, here's our second question. What are some common things that stop us or stop people from serving others? What are some common things that stop us from serving others? Go ahead. Okay, one more, one more question. And I know we all want more time to talk, uh, but I want to give you a, a few minutes to talk about this one. What are just some simple, practical ways that you can take up a towel and serve others? What are just some simple, practical ways that we can take up a towel and serve others? Go ahead. Okay, let's just stop and let's just stop and take a minute and pray. Okay, would you would you pray with me? Hmm. Let's pray. Okay, with every head bowed, your eyes closed. I want you to ask yourself that question: So what? I mean, how does what we talked about this morning apply to you, to me? I mean, every day we see the towel on the table and we see dirty feet, but are we willing to take up the f towel and willing to serve even some of the Judases in our life? Where can you take up a towel and serve others? Father, thank you for allowing your son to come and give us an undeniable example of how to serve, how to live, how to love. He lived the life of taking up the towel. Help us, help me to do the same. Today, open up our eyes to the towel and to the needs of those around us. Help us to take up that towel in Jesus' name and to serve you with that same kind of passion. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen, amen.